morning, South family. We are so happy to have you here with us virtually and online and in this new crazy culture. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Any new people that are out there, we are so happy to have you here as our guest. And I hope that you enjoy this time together. Please, as we are going about the service, um, comment and interact with us. Get to know us and we want to get to know you. So feel free to comment below. When you are ready to tithe your offerings for the week, we have lots of different options. You can give online, you can give via text message, you can drop off at the church and even mail in. So all of these instructions are at the top of our page, just pinned to the Facebook page. So feel free to do that. This Sunday is Palm Sunday, which is the beginning of Holy Week, which is my favorite time in the church calendar. Usually this time of year, we have things going on here at the church for you. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday service, and also Easter egg hunt. But because of the season that we're in, we wanted to create a Holy Week experience for you to have in your home. So on Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30, you can come to the new building, the CMC, and you can pick up an experiential Holy Week pack. Don't worry, we'll have on gloves. You do not have to get out of your car. Just pull in underneath the awning. We'll hand you a pack and you can be on your way. Again, if that time doesn't work for you from 5.30 to 6.30, you can also pick up the pack Monday through Thursday in our church office, which is open from 8 to noon. Hope that you're all being safe and well. Good morning, church. Uh, thank you for tuning in this morning. We truly just want to express that we miss seeing your faces. We really miss singing these songs with you guys and miss, miss just being able to be together in the presence of Jesus and uh, declaring our love for him, declaring what he has done for us. Um, and we want to invite you guys to make sure you're singing along at home. This isn't just videos for your entertainment. This is us worshiping together. And we're going to do that even though we can't physically be together. And I know you've heard that time and time again, but we really believe in the powerful uh, omnipresent Jesus that is going to bring us together and we're going to worship him as a body, as a unit, and still have that singular focus of our God and what he has done. So on this Palm Sunday, we want to invite you guys to worship. And so, so please sing along at home, invite your family to sing along at home. I don't care how bad it sounds, make that joyful noise this morning because um, we're going to worship Jesus and celebrate what he's done. So please worship with us. And come let us worship our King. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things.
Sing, I see the King of Glory. I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy. Washing over all our sin, the people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation. I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith. Selfless faith. I see a new revival. I see a new revival. Stirring as we pray and see. We're on our knees. We're on our knees. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Heal my heart. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours Everything I am for your kingdom's cause As I walk from earth into eternity Hosanna, Hosanna Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. 
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the high. Yeah, let's sing out Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. take an opportunity just to slow ourselves down and to enter into a time of prayer. We want to invite you to let us know what you need prayer for. You can mention those in the comments or you can email um, a member of the church staff or even direct message us through Facebook if it's of a private nature. But um, we've had several comments come through in the last couple weeks and we've been praying for those and we want to continue in prayer for those things. So we're going to read just really briefly from Romans chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers, making requests, and perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. I think that's such a beautiful encouragement is to when we can all be together and worship and pray together. And in the meantime, we will reach each other, no matter the cost, no matter what we need to do. We will continue to fight this fight with one another and for one another. So let us pray. Thank you, God, so much for a body of believers. Amen. Thank you for the church, for your bride, and just for the opportunity that we can worship in this country freely, God, in our own homes. Um, thank you so much just for the word of God and, and the access that we have to your precious word through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the freedom that he has given us, especially during this time of um, the Holy Week and just remembering his sacrifice and, and um, the freedom that we have because of his sacrifice and his choice to redeem us, Lord. Just thank you for our brothers and sisters all around the world, um, that we will continue to um, live in hope and in joy and in your love. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we seal all of this and we yeah. give it to you and we trust you with it. Amen.
I want to say hi to everybody who's joining us today. Um, if you're one of our regular family members, it's so good to have you joining us. We'd love for you to say hello below in the comments. Um, if you're new with us, if you're just checking out what God's up to around this community we call South, welcome. Please comment below. Let us get to know who you are and where you're from. Uh, over the last few months, in an almost prophetic way, we have been be leaning into a word. The word is exile. Uh, exile is this. Exile is an opportunity. Exile is an opportunity that God offers to the people that he loves to reset their affections. This is this is prophetically the season we live in, uh, an, an opportunity, if we'll look at it that way, for God to do a reset in our lives. Exile really begins here. Exile begins with a sense of loss. Any of you feeling a sense of loss right now? The loss of relational connection, the loss of occupation or a job, um, the loss of, of just that community of being able to get out, be active, see people. Um, any of you feeling a sense of loss when it comes to security? And in, in place of that security, you feel a depth of anxiety, maybe an underlying anxiety that's almost hard to put your finger on. Exile is the place where we feel a sense of loss. Our sense of exile really in some ways began in, in the end of December when out of China we heard news of something called the coronavirus and then COVID-19. Uh, by the end of January, our President Donald Trump was closing and in many ways traveled down from across the world. Uh, and then from there, just this past week, our, our state governor um, began to put in place orders for us to shelter in place and to, uh, to some extent, feel even another sense of loss. Uh, when I woke up on Thursday morning to do my quiet time and I finished up, I, I did something that was pretty customary for me, and that is I flipped through my news feed on my phone. Uh, this is what popped up immediately, and I took a screenshot of it because um, something happened in me viscerally. I had this reaction to it. Here's what the headline says from the Washington Post. National supply of emergency medical supplies is nearly depleted, Trump confirms. I had a moment. I had a moment like, like many of you have had moments in this, a loss of security, a oh no moment. Um, I think we have been facing this over and over. Uh, I literally thought to myself, I literally thought to myself, it's too much. Uh, would you just pause right now? Would you just, with everybody in your house or if you're alone, would you just say that with me out loud? Because I think this is communally, though we're not in the same room, communally, this is what we feel on this Palm Sunday. It's too much. Uh, the isolation is too much, the relational strain that having a family and all my little children, my teenagers all crammed into the house, the, the, the it's too much, I have no one here with me and I can't handle this much more, the, uh, the it's too much of I don't know how we're going to make ends meet this month and pay the bills, it's too much. I think that's how we feel. So can we, can we repeat that again together? Would you just take a real deep breath, a cleansing breath, and would you say it? God, it's too much. That's what we want to address today. The fact that we all feel like it's too much. Here's what I want to say. Processing our emotions in the midst of all of this loss is hard work. I mean, really processing what's going on in our our heart and soul, in our mind, how our body may be even, even exhibiting this loss um, physically. In the midst of all of this, it's hard work to get through and see what God is up to in the midst of this. And so the question is, how do apprentices of Jesus navigate emotional exile? 
How do we navigate this and reset our affections on God alone? Uh, this, is, this is probably going to be hard for some of you to hear. Exile is an opportunity. It's not an opportunity we choose. It's an opportunity that God gives us as a gift to bring the things that we have lifted up and elevated and put into priority in our life, the things that, that we have made our source of peace and comfort and hope and provision, uh, the things that ha have, have been the, the, the facades even that replace our anxiety and our fear, um, have entertained us, have numbed us so we can deal with all that's going on, exile is an opportunity that God gives us as a gift to, to make a, a, a map, a, a map of maturity to process through and reset our affections on God alone. All throughout scripture, this has been the story of God's people. And it's our story too. That this exile, that this Time of loss is an opportunity to bring high things low and reset our affections on God, who is our provision, who is our peace, who is our hope, who should be the center of our relationship. It's our opportunity. So how? How do we as apprentices of Jesus navigate emotion, emotional exile here, here's what I want to do. I want to take a moment to go through five things that maybe you will be going through. You may be at any spot in this journey, in this, uh, in this journey through the emotional exile that we're experiencing. Um, but five stages, and I want to go through them quickly one by one. And, and maybe you have been here already, a sense of denial, emotionally refusing to believe that this change is real. Oh no, this isn't going to last very long. It'll be back to normal next week. Or, oh hey, this is just fake news. Hey, I don't care who you are, what you're feeling, what you're believing. Denial is something that all apprentices of Jesus go through. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, which I've been journeying through in, in this Lenten season, uh, the disciples um, say this. Jesus in Mark 9 says to the disciples, I'm going to give up my life. I'm going to die. I'm going to become the atoning sacrifice for all people, bringing all nations, all people together under God again, uh, making the relationship relationship right with God. And, and Peter pulls him aside and, and Mark 9 says, Peter rebukes him. And I mean, gets in Jesus' face and says, no, Jesus, you've got this wrong. He's in a place of denial. Jesus, this can't be. This reality can't change. You've been multiplying resources, food, provision. You've been healing people. Nope, this has got to keep going just the way it is. It's just the way I like it. And by the way, I like my position in all of this. Peter's in a sense of denial like we are in a sense of denial at times about this. The, the second feeling is this is anger. Uh, from denial, we find this place of anger, emotionally striving to build up, to kind of prop up, to gird up the order and structure in our life in the midst of loss, trying to keep it all together. I imagine it in my mind, a, a, a tower of cards that has been built and it begins to topple it and we're just trying to wrap our arms around it and keep it in place but it's going to topple. And so in anger, I hit the table because I cannot believe that my tower of cards that I spent so much time constructing has, has just fallen apart. Uh, the next is this, this place of, of, of bargaining, this place where we start to make a mental, emotional negotiation, striving to get back what once was. And we see the, uh, the disciples of Jesus doing this all throughout the Gospel of Mark. But one case, um, these two brothers of, of thunder, um, James and John, come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, when you're king, this is what they're saying, can we have this? Can we sit on your right and in your left? And they begin to negotiate what they get out of what's going on. And Jesus tells them they don't understand. And so in, in the feeling of all the change, they're wanting to secure their position. And that's what we do. We begin to bargain to try to secure what we have or what we've had. Um, honestly, bargaining 
is a way of us trying to preserve the past, preserve how we once felt, instead of going through what's happening now, the opportunity that God has put before us. Uh, the next is this, is depression. And there are multiple grades of depression. So uh, please hear me. You might be saying, hey, I don't have depression. I'm not one of those people. I'm not weak. I, let me say there are multiple levels of depression. Uh, depression is the manifestation of the loss you're feeling. Uh, maybe it is some sort of, of I'm withdrawing even more. Uh, I, I, I have anxiety. I'm, I'm sobbing uncontrollably. Um, it can happen mentally. It can exhibit itself physically. I get it right here in the back of my neck and shoulders. And I just get tense. And, uh, and, and then I get more rigid in everything I do. And, and it's a mild form of depression that I'm very aware that I've been sensing and going through. And it becomes a fog. It's like you get up really in the morning when the sun's come up and it's really hot and the fog gets really, really thick and, and you're having a hard time saying, can I make it through this? I can't see beyond my hand here. How do I navigate through what I don't understand and what I can't see? And that's what depression feels like. So if you felt that way, you just may be feeling some forms of depression. These are the opportunities we have to become aware of what we're feeling and what we're thinking and God gives us a map of maturity then there's this final phase which is what I hope we're all going for I might call it maturity but we'll call it acceptance in this it's the stage of emotionally accepting the new reality this is real whether I like it or not this is real and striving I need to start striving to navigate through this as hard as it is. So, here's the next question. What would it look like if you navigated the fog of loss and change, what we're calling exile, and set your whole affections on Jesus? What would happen if you navigated this by saying, hey, I need a point of reference in all of this mess. I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus alone. The only thing that is unchanging, the only thing that is certain when I wake up tomorrow is that God, Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit are unchanging and I can lean in to the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want to take a moment here. I want to take a moment and, and look at Mark chapter 9. Uh, it, it is a powerful moment. Uh, let me set the context a little bit. Jesus has made his way into Jerusalem. He's entered into the gates on today, Palm Sunday, the day when people are cheering and saying, Hosanna, the king has come. This is, this is the one. Uh, we're going to get behind him politically. We're going to get behind this person. That has happened, and now Jesus is preparing to eat, um, eat the Passover meal to celebrate what God has done in the past and bring it into the present. And as he does this, he, he finds himself going to the house. Well, let's read it here. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, now let's just pause, context, talk about social distancing. Simon the leper. If you don't know what leprosy is, just pause and Google this right now. Leprosy. In the scriptural times and still throughout the world today, leprosy is a real deal. It's a condition in the body and the skin where um, literally limbs fall off. You get scales and patches and, 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 and your skin, it just kind of melts away. And in Jewish times, in, in the scriptural times, Jews distanced themselves from people with this kind of sickness. But Jesus comes into Holy Week to the Passover meal, and he celebrates it in Mark's gospel so, with a social distanced person. And then, if that's not a low enough person, check this out, a woman. A woman came with an alabaster jar. Uh, hey, it doesn't get lower than a woman. 
and she comes with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume and made made of pure nard. She broke the jar open and poured the perfume over his head. Uh, some of these, um, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, "Why the waste of this perfume?" Um, it could have been sold for more than a year's worth of wages and the money given to the poor. And they, apprentices of Jesus who don't like change, who don't understand how to navigate the changing times, who are only seeing what has been and what they like, um, they miss out and they harshly rebuke those who are leaning in to the change. And Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. Jesus isn't saying, don't worry about poor people. Don't meet needs. He's saying, they're always going to be here. You can choose your time, but the moment to seize the opportunity in the midst of this exile, you're not always going to have me. So she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for burial. I want to take a moment. I want you to lean in. Would you just like lean to the edge of your chair and would you listen really, really carefully? The question posed right here, and it's a question that's just as legitimate today as it was then. How much is too much devotion to Christ? How much is too much devotion to Jesus? You know, these disciples at the moment, they've left their families, their things, uh, but they've kind of gotten comfortable in their faith walk with Jesus, and at this point, they want Jesus and. I want my position, Jesus. Can I be at your right or your left? Jesus, I, I, I really want you to be a political leader, so I'm following you uh, if you do this. Jesus, I'm in with you as long as I can pull out my sword and I can take action the way I want to. Jesus, I'm all in as long as you keep making miracles happen and multiplying resources and doing the things that, that really meet my needs. But I want you and financial security. I want you and all uh, of the things I want. I want you and entertainment. I want you and my rhythm and schedule and the way things have been. Hey, if you've said at any point today, it's just too much. Jesus is giving you an opportunity at this very moment to lean in, to lean in to seize an opportunity to allow this moment in time to reset your affections, to reset your habits, to reset your mindset, to reset, uh, again, your affections. Because what we love and where we set our affections, we put all of our time, all of our resources, all of our devotion, all of our commitment, and uh, hey, when things become more important than Jesus, we want them. And give me a little Jesus on the side. But this, this woman, the disciples are saying, isn't this too much? Don't you get it? Uh, and, and Jesus' response, um, response is, hey, listen, this woman has done an awesome thing. Uh, I want to I kind of begin the conclusion with this. What can we learn about navigating our changing reality from this paragon of faith? From this woman that is the top of the top at this moment, who looks at the circumstances and sees them for what they really are, an opportunity. What can we learn from her? Three things really quickly. In, ex in the exile of change and emotional fog, focus on Jesus. That's, that's it. That's the bottom of the line. In the midst of this, she didn't say, hey, I'm afraid he, he is going to um, leave us high and dry financially. I'm afraid that we're going to, all the, the time we've spent over the last few years following this guy, it's, it's all for sake because uh, he's gone. Uh, she's not worrying about those things at all. She managed the change by focusing on Jesus. Do you know what the disciples, the apprentices of Jesus, the males in this story did? 
They were focusing on themselves. They were focusing on what they'd done. They were focusing on their status, on their comfort, on uh, whether or not they could set things up for tomorrow, and they were missing it. And this woman simply focused on Jesus in the midst of the fog. So again, the question is always how. Well, I, I want to give you this three how-tos really quickly. First, worship and adore him extravagantly. Worship and adore him extravagantly. That, that may mean different things for different people, but this woman, she brought in a jar, an alabaster jar full of perfume, of oil. Uh, oil in scripture is used to anoint kings, Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Oil is what's used to prepare a body after it's died. Um, this woman brings in a jar of oil that's worth one year's wages. Now let's just get real practical. This is a holy devotion to Jesus. It says it was worth one year's wages. Let's just take the minimum wage in the state of Florida. Let's take that for 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year. And let's just say that's what this woman brought and anointed and poured out in front of Jesus. $17,600. Minimum wage, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks in the year. And she just brings this and pours it over the head of Jesus. It runs down his scalp, over his body. And the disciples say, what are you doing? It's too much. It's too much. And Jesus says, you don't get it. She understands what's happening next. I'm giving my life and she's preparing my body for burial. She recognized that Jesus is going to give all, so she was willing to give all. She realized that Jesus was, was going to sacrifice all he had, so what is one year of my work to pour out before Jesus? And so she just pours it over him. It's extravagant worship. I don't know what your extra extravagant worship is, if it's a sacrifice financially to help others. I don't know if it is making time. I tell you what, the rhythm of time and the importance of setting time apart is costly. Maybe setting apart the best part of your day to worship Jesus and get right with him is the starting point. Uh, worshiping, uh, finding our videos to help you worship, reading scripture, praying. I could go on and on, but I won't. Secondly. Focus on what Jesus really says. Uh, a problem that the disciples had is they heard what Jesus said, but in hearing what Jesus said, they heard what they wanted to hear. And Jesus had to correct them multiple times throughout. When Peter came in Mark 9 and said, nope, you cannot die for us, Jesus rebuked him and then said, oh, by the way, a real disciple of me is going to take up their cross too and follow me. Uh, so Jesus really says things and sometimes, especially in our modern culture, we like to take it out of context and make, make it say what we want it to say. I, I want to say to you, look deeper and see what Jesus really says. This woman got it, and it shaped her, her moment, her focus, the opportunity in exile to be uh, reset her affections and say, I'm all in, Jesus. Whatever you do, I'm all in. Third. She seized an opportunity to show love like Jesus. Um, I have to think that, that this woman really thought through this, really planned through it, really thought about when to seize this moment. We have opportunities to seize. The question is, will we or won't we? Will we let it slip by or will we just go through the rhythm and routine like we always do? She seized the opportunity. Exile is a gift an opportunity from God to reset your affections. This is what she does. She seized the opportunity before her. So as we conclude, I, I want to get really practical. Uh, the question is, how do we, how, how do you seize the opportunity to show love, adoration, and whole devotion to Jesus? I mean, how do we do it? What might you practically do to seize the moment within exile? Um, I want to look really closely at Mark chapter 14, verse 8. When Jesus um, speaks back to the disciples, and I think with 
a pretty stern tone. He says, uh, why are you bothering her? She did what she could. Now just highlight that, underline it. What did she do? She did what she could. She, she didn't do more than she could do. She didn't do less than she could do. She did what she could. What she could do was she could pour out perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for burial, Jesus said. This woman had the ability to see what was happening and seize the moment and the opportunity with what she had. Um, as we do this, I, I want to tell you a story about our church, about our church family. This picture on the left side you probably recognize this is the, the headlines from Thursday morning. National supply, of uh, national supply of emergency medical supplies is nearly depleted, Trump confirms, from the Washington Post. Wednesday night, I got this text message and I did a screen capture. And um, below is uh, 25 surgical masks that people in our congregation and friends of our congregation have sewed together themselves. And they've been distributed to rehabilitation centers, nursing home, uh, to, to people who really need these and can't get them. Last week I was told the story of the first delivery. And when they were taken in, they were received at the door um, and the, the lady was literally moved to tears because of what people have done. That's so unbelievably powerful. Um, these folks, they simply have done what they can do. Now, maybe you're not going to sew together surgical masks. Maybe that's not your thing. I don't know what your thing is. Maybe it's calling on a neighbor. Maybe it's uh, uh, delivering Grubhub to somebody you know needs a, a meal. Maybe it's just texting people. Uh, may, maybe it is to um, clean up somebody's yard. I, I don't know what it is right now. But there are things that you can do. And an example of our devotion and our commitment to Jesus is to know what we can do and do it. As we close up today, I want to remind you that, of this, that exile is an opportunity, a gift given by God for us to reset our affections on Jesus. I pray that this time, this time of changing seasons and moments and fear and anxiety and denial and all of the, the list of things that we go through, that it would be an opportunity to fix your eyes on Jesus to make it through the fog. Let's pray together. God, I just lift up to you in this moment each individual who's watching this message, and I ask that you would bring them peace that you would speak a blessing into their life, that you would take the it's too much that they're feeling and facing and that you would show them that this is their moment, this is their opportunity to reset their affections and help them to see where you are in this, even when it doesn't match up with what we want and prefer. God, we just ask that this week you would protect our congregation, that you would be with our leaders, and Lord, um, that you would help us to celebrate Holy Week with different eyes, eyes to see what you're doing here and now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this week.